I remind you that we come trusting thee and believing thee. I ask that great Holy Ghost conviction may come upon this congregation mightily, I ask it. I pray tonight for every sinner, for every backslider, for every lukewarm Christian, for every child of God that's facing a battle in this moment. I pray tonight, O oh God, that you would move graciously through this congregation. Touch every heart that contains the black stain of sin. Help them to know that it's not much longer to get ready, O oh God. And Lord, I'll ask it in your glorious name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. amen. I've had the privilege and occasion to preach several camp meetings in the state of Indiana. And Indiana is Billy Sunday country. Billy Sunday once preached a revival meeting in Cleveland, Ohio that shook that center of Catholicism. For weeks, the Sunday tabernacle was filled to absolute capacity. Thousands of people were coming. They came to hear that talented choir under the leadership of Homer Rodehaver. But above, above all, they came to hear the dynamic preaching of the gospel under Billy Sunday. There was an atheist in that city, an affluent man, a man that was prosperous, a man that was cultured, but yet a man that said he did not believe that this was the Word of God. He didn't really believe there was a God. Everywhere that he went, he saw the big streaming banners across the boulevards that informed he and the public of the Billy Sunday meeting. He heard it over every medium of advertisement and communication. And more out of curiosity than anything else, he went and attended one night. The subject of that evangelist message was the scripture that I read to you tonight, What Shall the End Be? Thousands of people throbbed in capacity in that auditorium that evening. And that man of God preached as he seldom preached under such a powerful anointing. The Spirit of God flowed like a river through that audience. That man that considered himself an atheist stumbled from that audience that night. He did not listen to the pleadings of the evangelist as he begged for men to hit the sawdust trail for Jesus. He did not listen. He heard it and yet he listened, but he did not heed as the altar call was given and the choir began to sing, Coming Home. He stumbled like a drunken man out from under the confines of that huge auditorium that night. And as he walked away, he was totally unimpressed by the great choir that he had heard. Totally unimpressed by the gigantic audience that was there that night. Totally unimpressed by the colloquialisms and by the mannerisms of this sensational preacher of the gospel. But that text grabbed his heart. It plowed like a, a path through his soul. It seemed to cut to the very marrow of his heart. He looked up and the twinkle of the stars seemed to cry, what shall the end be? The croaking of the frog seemed to bellow, what, what shall the end be? The chirping of the cricket seemed to say, what shall the end be? You listen to this preacher today, mister. I pray to God in this Assemblies of God movement that we never get to the place that we place the Word of God into the background. For it's the preaching of the gospel that stirs men's hearts, that digs down into the deep of their soul, that brings out their sins and thereby brings them to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no power like the power of the preached Word of God Almighty. There is no glory. There is there's no strength like this word of God that I hold in my hand preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the word of God touched him. It hit him like a sledgehammer. It buried into his heart. 
He went home that night. He tried to shake it off. He tried to retire to bed, but sleep would not come. Tossing and tumbling on that bed of anxiety and worry. What shall the end be? It hit him. It suffocated him. It drowned him. What shall the end be? The end is coming. There is a reckoning day. And if there's a God, oh Lord, I'll meet him. If there is a judgment, I'll face it. If there is a hell, I'm going there. What shall the end be? He got out of bed unable to sleep. Walked to his library, pulled down the writings of Strauss, Spencer, Kahn, Ingersoll, Voltaire, read their seemingly logical arguments against God, against his Bible, against his word. But still, even though he looked at the words on their pages, those words leaped out at him, what shall the end be? And finally, so overwhelmed with Holy Ghost conviction, he fell on his knees and looked up to God. God Almighty and said Lord if you are there and you are real he said I've never prayed to you in my life I have thought and I have said that this is foolishness and some sensational fanaticism somewhere this is for those that are ignorant this is just for the masses that know no better but he said oh God I can't get away from it I know that if that preacher preached the truth and your word is real and if there is even a chance that it's real and there is a hell I am going there and I'll burn forever and forever God would you have mercy upon my soul let me feel thy presence if you are real and brother in just a moment's time God opened up the doors of heaven walked down the starry steps of glory embraced that hell bound sinner in his arms smothered him with the love of almighty God cleansed the stain that besmirched his sin benighted soul wrote his name down in the Lamb's book of life and that man began to weep under the total anointing of the Holy Spirit let me tell you tonight I don't care how many questions are in your mind I don't care if you came to this service tonight with so many things you don't understand. Questions you cannot answer. A little bit confused. You don't really know what's right and what isn't right. Which direction to take. If there is an ounce of sincerity and earnestness in your heart, God will meet you. He'll answer your question. He'll satisfy that craving that's within the depths of your soul. Come and let us reason together, Seth the Lord of hosts. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white like wool. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? What is the gospel of God? That's a question that is asked by so many theologians. It's asked by so many modernistic professors of religion. It is asked by so many common people today, what is the gospel of God? I'm afraid that our interfering our hands and our so-called intellectual minds, we have so confused the gospel of God until the biggest majority of the people today do not know what it is. They have become confused listening to men of the faith so-called that have ridiculed this book that have lambasted God that have blasphemed his holy name that have joked about the fables called miracles they have told men this and told men that but I'm here to tell you tonight I know what the gospel is that book tells it to us in no uncertain terms and it's so simple a child can understand it for I understood it when I was eight years of age and walked down the aisle a little weeping boy and Jesus Christ saved my soul and baptized me in the Holy Ghost and called me to preach this gospel the gospel of God it's good news mister good news good news it's the greatest message that man has ever known it's the greatest story ever told it's the greatest song ever sung it's the greatest happening that ever took place the gospel of God is good news 
Good news to every sinner, that he doesn't have to be lost and go to hell. Good news to every drunkard, that those demon clutches of hell that bind your soul, and you are unable to break that hellish chain that drags you down, that Jesus Christ can set the drunkard free. Good news to those of you that are filled with the ravages of lust, never satisfied, going deeper and deeper into a quagmire of filth and shame that Jesus Christ can lift you up. Good news, mister, to old brother Noah that day when God spoke to him and said, Noah, I want you to build an ark for the salvation of you and your family. And as he rode those waves that day, it was good news to him. Brother, that old ark is still there for you to get on board. And the doors are wide open and the storm is soon to come. I can hear the rumbling of the thunders of judgment on the horizon tonight. The headlines of every newspaper scream that time is running out. Scientists are telling us that time is running out. Chemists and biochemists are looking at horror at the hellish weapons that man has created but yet unable somehow to put them to peaceful use and telling us the time is running out. Riot and revolution in the streets is telling us the time is running out. That powder keg of Israel that's setting on a, a powder keg that threatens to explode in any moment is telling the whole world time is running out. Time is running out. And brother, at this moment, that old ark of God is setting with doors wide open. And the call of God's going to a lost and dying world to get in. The drops of drains of God's judgment are beginning to fall tonight. And those of you that may be so close, so near, that's not enough, mister. You must get in. You must get in. You must get in. Good news that you can get in. Good news to that dying thief on the cross. After a life of sin and the ignominy of shame, hanging there for his crimes committed against society, blood that poured from multitudinous contusions and wounds, lips that were cracked and caked with dried blood, and a heart that was beating its last. He looked through blinded tears and said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And the Lord gritted his teeth against the pain, and our blessed Savior said this day, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. Good news, good news. Good news when Brother Jairus a leader in the synagogue fell down at Jesus' feet on a dusty road in full view of anyone. He didn't care who saw him. This was past feeling now. It didn't matter that his social position had just now plummeted. It did not matter that he had lost his place in earth's famous 400. 